Good afternoon. Thanks for uh, coming to uh, to uh, the weekly Bar Barship uh, seminar, Shock Center seminar series, and Pepper Center seminar series all uh, merged. And um, um, it's uh, it's a honor uh, to introduce Dr. Rabinovich. And there's so many good things to say about him um, that I'll just pick pick a, 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 a few. Um, Dr. Rabinovich is well known to our, to our faculty, he has visited the bar shop and Bandera uh, a few times. Um, he is a, uh, uh, he graduated mag magna cum laude in the University of Washington and he was born and lived in, in Seattle all, all his life, I learned that yesterday. And then he obtained his PhD and MD also at University of Washington and then trained as a pathologist um, there and then um, has just been rising through the ranks rapidly and been a professor since 1992. Uh, he is a world-renowned uh, gerontologist and, um, and um, mitochondrial biologist. And um, he has been uh, continuously funded by NIH for many, many years. He has a, a PO1 looking at cardiac aging, and he has been the, P, the, the um, uh, PI of the uh, Shock Center at Washington since its in inception, I believe, was probably the first one, uh, sh uh, Shock Center. Um, and um, he is um, uh, also very known for being extremely generous with his knowledge, uh, with his data, and, and reagents. So it's, re it's a real pleasure to, to have uh, Peter, and he's going to tell us uh, his latest on a relationship between mitochondria and aging. Thank you, Peter. Okay. I'm going to see if I can. This one doesn't seem to work, but I, I see that that microphone does. Yeah, I, I tried to do that. Okay. Did I? I think it, it's, it says that it's on, but we're not getting any action. Yeah, maybe we can start with this and then. Yeah. If, you, um, if we have our colleagues from IT visit with us, thank you. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Nick, very much for that very generous and kind introduction. Uh, and this seems to work pretty well, so we'll, we'll go with that. Um, I can see the TV screen, but I don't, I don't think you can see that. So, um, so. Okay, great. Well, it's a pleasure to come come uh, back to San Antonio, and I see that you accommodated me by bringing Seattle weather so that I felt right at home. Um, but you need the rain more than we do, so, uh, so uh, it's better for you than for us. Um, this is going to be a, a talk on, uh, on my favorite topic in the sense of, of there's a translational impact to this that has been very satisfying to me after having worked in the field of aging for for a very long time in terms of the basic biology of aging, the, the opportunity to extend it in a translational direction is one which is, is very exciting. And I know many of you and other of our colleagues uh, are going in the same direction, and it's, and it's really, uh, this is the, the, the new frontier for us in terms of uh, making that last step to go from, from, um, from invertebrate models to, the, to mammals and finally uh, be able to to pre put these in, in what might be thought of as almost preclinical studies. And as I show you there, that, that uh, some aspects of these uh, work are, are really um, translating as well to the human trials. So this is going to be uh, on, um, on mitochondrial function, and, and I've titled this Extending Health Span and Reversing Aging, but I'm going to be talking uh, primarily about muscle function uh, with, uh, with uh, some other aspects that will maybe generalize it a tiny bit. The work to put it in context, though, in this direction really began with George Martin, whose picture is there, sort of the, the senior gerontologist at, at my institution. And George was working with a, a graduate student at the time, Sam Schreiner, and uh, spent a long time making transgenic mice overexpressing ca uh, catalase. And they, they were overexpressed to, to mitochondria, to to the peroxisome and to nuclei. And of these, when was overexpressed to mitochondria, the MCAT model, this was associated with the extension of, of mean and maximal lifespan that you see here. So just to remind you that the catalase is, 
is catalyzing the conversion of hydrogen peroxide to water, preventing the Fenton reaction production of uh, the hydroxyl radical and, and free radical injury. So this was followed up with uh, a large number of MCAT phenotypes. And a few of these, a subset that's fairly small, in fact, were done by our own laboratory. Um, and uh, a very large number of them were done by people for whom we have, have sent these mice to. So you'll see that I've, I've lumped these. There are cancer phenotypes, reduction of various cancer models, uh, metabolic syndrome, including diabetes, insulin resistance, um, and uh, sensory defects, including hearing and vision, uh, retinitis pigmentosum, uh, neurodegeneration in a, in a variety of things, ranging from Parkinson's to Alzheimer's uh, to um, memory and anxiety effects. Uh, and then finally, muscle function, which I'm going to return to. Um, and this has included uh, both uh, skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle, and I will be talking about cardiac muscle. All of these, except for the very last one, are benefits of the MCAT phenotype. Uh, and I'm going to come back to this in a second. Um, but the, the last of these that was uh, done in Joe Dorn's laboratory was an experiment in which he used two of our models. One of them was the transgenic MCAT that was used in almost all of the of the preceding models, and, and that's at a very high level of expression. That's about 100-fold more catalase in the mitochondria than is present in the, in the cell to begin with, mainly that the, the native being in peroxisomes. So that was coupled with a second model, which was a, a, in, a inducible model. And depending on the promoter, one gets various activities. But in this case, it was substantially lower, uh, about 30-fold lower. And what Gerald found was that that in his cardiac mitofusin 2 knockout model, high levels of MCAT suppressed autophagy, which was bad, but that lower levels were beneficial. So this was really a bit of, a, a bit of the dual nature, which brings us to the, to the point that, I, that, that, that antioxidants in general, um, and this comes, comes as especially relevant to to coming to San Antonio because very much of the work on antioxidants was done here by Arlen Richardson and, and his collaborators. Um, and uh, the story on antioxidants is complicated. And, uh, and Arlen and his collaborators uh, published papers suggesting that the, that the free radical theory of aging was dead. And now, it, however, it, it, it gets more complicated. Even the MCAT model is complicated. And I'll take a little bit of a sidelight by just telling you something that our Nathan Shock Center does uh, fairly well with the help of Mike McCoss is proteomics. So we do global proteomics, and if we do that in an aging animal and a young animal, we see a change in significant proteins. And there were 379 of those in the study that I'm going to be telling you about that were different between young and old wild type mice. Now, what we did was we took the magnitude of that change, whether it was an up or a down, we called that 100%, and that on average was a five and a half fold change in those 379 that were significant. And that's the, that's the increase here, if I can get the mouse to, there's the mouse, it, from here in the young at zero to 100 in old by definition. But that, that's the definition of, a, 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 of this, this, this um, aging index. Um, and now if we looked at the MCAT animals when they were old, I'll start on the right, then you'll see, in fact, this is, this is what we had hypothesized, that these animals have a, have a proteomic aging signature which looks much more youth, youthful. There are two lines here. One was, one was our most definitive study, which is, is with the round symbols. And the, the first was actually an initial study. It was actually our second study, because in both the pilot study and the second study, we, we got the effect that I'm going to show you, and, and we didn't really believe it. And it took three times for us to get the same answer for us to, to see. Because what was surprising was that when we looked at the young animals, their proteomic signature looked older. And so you see that we really have a, a crossing line. The MCAT signature looks old when it's young and young when it's old. Uh, the reversal of the trend that one sees with aging. And this is in the heart, where the MCAT expression is high. If you look in liver, where we have very low expression, then one sees essentially very little difference, as one might expect, since there's not much MCAT in that tissue. So this really gives, gives rise to, or a concordance with the theory that, that in aging, there are increasing levels of ROS. And in the young animals, this is, they are optimal for redox signaling, and that adding MCAT to this makes them suboptimal, inhibits the optimal, makes suboptimal with poor redox and a decline in proteostatic mechanisms. Whereas in aging, they, they are 
normally at pathological levels with oxidative damage and a decline in, in effective protein turnover, but that the MCAT returns this to a more youthful level. So, so this is really, um, really a, an example of antagonistic pleiotropy, where the effects of, of ROS uh, are antagonistic. They're good for the young and bad for the old, and the effect of MCAT is the reversal of that. Um, bad for the young and good for the old. So I put this in uh, both because I'm talking in San Antonio and because I think it's, it's interesting um, to talk about some of the differences between this and what I'll tell, be talking about in the rest of the talk, which is not actually going to turn out to be antioxidants. This is what we thought we were looking for, and we began with a search for a pharmacologic, pharmacologic analog to MCAT, and we thought we, that meant that we were looking for mitochondrial targeted catalase. And because the, the aging experiment took three years, we wanted a, a shorter term effect. And because we were seeing a very significant effect, as I'll describe later, in the heart, um, we chose cardiac phenotypes. So the first of these was angiotensin II induced cardiac dysfunction. And of, of the several antioxidants, quote unquote, that we, we looked at, the one that worked best was actually SS31. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. It's a tetrapeptide, and I'll, I'll delve into that in a moment, but after showing you the initial data that suggested why we'd be interested in this. So this is the increase in cardiac size, echocardiographic left ventricular myocardial index. And it goes up by 60%, and in the PCAT model with its litter mates, it wasn't affected at all. Two models of, of MCAT, the low-level inducible and the high-level constitutive, constitutive, suppress this hypertrophy. And the... And the the SS31, if it's delivered for four weeks by osmotic mini pump at the same time that the angiotensin is being delivered for four weeks, one sees a substantial suppression of, of the systolic, or excuse me, the hypertrophy. Down here on the left is diastolic function, and I'm going to spend a little time telling you about that since this turns out to be interesting in aging. But it was protected in the MCAT models, both of them, and similarly in the SS peptide. And here's the heart weight and also protected as the echocardiographic data suggested. The second model is transverse aortic constriction. So this is a model not of hypertrophy, but of failure. And one, one sees hypertrophy, but one also sees a decline in fractional shortening. So here's, here's the hypertrophy and the MCAT sparing of that with, with down a little bit in the heart, lung weight goes up in failure models as well. The fractional shortening declines, so this is the contractile function of the heart, and is protected by MCAT. The SS peptide actually did a better job, and you can see that the same effects but larger magnitude here, and a, a better protection of fractional shortening. So the SS peptide was what really got us interested in as initially thought of as being a, a pharmacologic analog of a mitochondrially targeted antioxidant. Well, it turned out that the SS31, as it was studied um, by our PO1 collaborator and the co-inventor of the peptides, Hazel Zito, um, she has published several papers suggesting uh, evidence that it binds to cardiolipin, it enhances cytochrome C-mediated electron transfer and ATP production while reducing cytochrome C peroxidase activity. And I'll return to a potential mechanism for this in a moment. But, the, but here's what the SS peptide looks like in terms of its structure. Uh, it's tetrapeptide uh, with, uh, with a D-arginine uh, and a dimethyltyrosine. The dimethyltyrosine confirm here confirms, confers some electron scavenging capacity, but an analog of this SS20 that doesn't have the dimethyltyrosine and has no electron scavenging or antioxidant activity has most of the activity that the SS31 does, and in some situations all of it. Hazel has, has given a schematic superimposing the SS31 over the head group of, of, the, of cardiolipin here, suggesting that, that it is interacting with the head group and facilitating the, the electron carrying function rather than the peroxidase activity. So Bendavia is the name that's been given to it for its translation to the clinic. The Wild Cornell Medical College licensed this to Stealth Biotherapeutics, uh, a private company that is translating it and is currently in phase two clinical trials for chronic heart failure, sarcopenia, diabetic retinopathy, um, and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, aging uh, uh, macular degeneration uh, and genetic diseases of, of mitochondrial origin. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the sarcopenia because 
because that study in sarcopenia, the chronic heart failure study, and the diabetic retinopathy studies all came from, um, from preclinical data in mice that I'll be telling you about uh, as a result of our program project work. So one of the hypothetical mechanisms for, for how, how the, the tetrapeptide and, and its interaction with cytochrome C and cardiolipin is Im improving its function comes from looking at, at cytochrome C oxidation at, at MET80. So there is a methionine uh, here in, in, near the heme active center that is involved in, in heme coordination. Uh, the heme is in red, the MET80 is here in yellow. Um, and if one looks at, at oxidation um, with an antibody to MET80, then the six-month-old animals are low, the 26-month-old animals is higher, and the 26-month-old animal is returned to lower levels. That's an example. Here is the, the data from, from um, multiple observations uh, showing that this, the significant increase with age and protection by SS31 here in the heart and uh, similarly here in skeletal muscle. Um, and uh, similar pictures, although the skeletal muscle increase with age uh, was even larger than in the heart. So, um, so this gives a possible, a possible hypothesis. We were. Oh, great. Um, yes, let me just check the settings here and make sure you're not. And now I can wander around. Oh, and I, I can tell it. It already works. Okay. If I did both of them, I would, I'm sure it overpower everyone. Okay. So. Okay. I'm assuming everybody can hear me as well as I can hear myself. Um, so, so it it is it is known that the that that oxidation of methionine gives rise to a change gives rise to a change in the in the heme coordination state that will, will promote its peroxidase activity, and this is actually uh, what was consistent with Hazel's initial hypothesis and and some of the data that was in the slide that I referred you to. So, um, also uh, mentioning one of the. Um, in, in terms of redox status, one of the specialties uh, we have in the University of Washington is that Kevin Conley uh, does magnetic, magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And I'm going to show you some data relating to 31P phosphorus measurements of, of ATP. But it turns out that, that at the same time, one can get some, some indication of the NADP redox state. And if one looks at, at old mouse, mu mouse muscle here, there is an, an increase uh, that he gets. Now, the interesting thing about this is that these are totally in vivo measurements. So one of the difficulties in doing assays of oxidation uh, is that the, there's a challenge between translating them from, from in the mouse to in the test tube. Uh, and this gets around that by doing these uh, in live mice that are placed inside the magnet. So with the SS31 administration, uh, one sees that, that there is a an increased reduction state. And his historical levels for the young animals were here. So um, this was possibly even more so. But this was a significant difference between before and after. So this gives a potential redox uh, connection. That was carried further by Dave Marcinek, who, who collaborated with uh, Dr. Weijun Kian at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratories, our neighbors on the other side of the Cascade Mountains. And this was an assay that does thiol affinity enrichment on resin triptych digestion. And then this goes uh, to uh, a special labeling technique. And then one has the peptides go into, into LCMS MS. And Dave looked at all, looked for, for, for cysteine residues that were significantly different in terms of their, 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 their thiolation state. Uh, between both the young old comparison and the and the old SS31 comparison, and when he looked at those, they there was a, a concordance. That is to say, these in the old group uh, here have increased thiolation, uh, and in the young group in blue, you can see they were they were were down. There's one exception that's in the reverse direction. But the key point here is that the old plus the SS peptide looked like the young. And that was even true of, of this one here. So the coordinated status of the, of the old treated with SS peptide looking like young is an unbiased confirmation here that the, that the, the old animals became more youthful in terms of their thiol redox status um, by this assay. 
So the real driving force, I'm telling the story a little bit backwards, because the real driving force for having been interested in this and in changes that relate to, to changes in the redox environment as opposed to, say, a traditional antioxidant uh, effect was an observation that, that Dave made several years ago, which was that after we had been working with, with long-term delivery, uh, that is to say eight-week delivery or in the transgenic mouse for, for many years, Dave had the idea of treating treating the mice for just one hour uh, with the SS peptide by an intraperitoneal injection and then putting them in the, uh, in the magnet and doing uh, P, P31 uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And in doing this, he also has an apparatus in which you, you can measure the oxygenation state of myoglobin so you can look at the oxygen consumption. And you can generate both the P to O that is to say the, the high energy ATPs that are made per unit of oxygen and the ATP max. The P to O declines with age. That's the difference between here and here. And the effect of SS31 on, on the youthful animals is nothing at all. But on the old animals, it increases the P to O ratio in the old muscle from the depleted state uh, to very close to the youthful state. And the ATP max, this is the rate of maximum ATP generation. This is done with a cuff around the thigh of, of the mouse, and, and once one, uh, one gets a depletion of ATP, but when you restore blood flow, you get a, a, a rapid uh, re, uh, re energetic uh, uh, return, and you can measure the rate of ATP production, that's ATP max. That's depleted in the old animals, and, and again, the SS31 has an effect only on the old animals, returning them to youthful levels. So this was a surprise to us in terms of, of an acute effect and is consistent with having gone back and figured out that this is likely to be, be a redox effect much more than a correction of, for instance, of, of, of oxidative damage to proteins which would have to be, or DNA, which would have to be um, replaced, uh, uh, which would accumulate slowly and be, re be replaced more slowly. Dave went on to look, and I'll stay on the muscle story for just a little bit, uh, to look at the muscle performance. So this is, this is in the isolated, uh, muscle, it's, it still has its, its, uh, its vascular and neural connections, but the, the distal tendon is put on a force uh, a stress indicator, and one can look at the force versus time with repetic tetanic stimuli. And that goes down in the old animals, but, the, but it, with, if the old animals are treated with the SS31 prior to the, prior to the tetanic stimulation, um, then one gets uh, the, the, the uh, the fraction of the resting force is increased. That's summarized here. Treadmill endurance in youthful animals is really not affected by the SS31. But in the old animals, you'll see that the old animals in black here are at a level of running time, which is appreciably lower than that of the young animals. But that at four weeks, one starts to see an increase, which is larger and becomes significant at, at eight weeks of time. So we're not entirely back to the youthful level, which on this scale would be up here, but we're almost halfway back to that uh, after a eight-week treatment with the SS peptide in terms of, of running time. I'm going to take, before I come back to the heart, I'm going to take the last diversion into another phenotype, and this is, is vision function. And visual function uh, is done by, by Hazel Zito and, and Glenn Prusky uh, at the Cornell Medical College. And this is done, done in, in a system which is, which is opto, called optokinetics. Uh, and the SS31 is administered by ophthalmic drops once a day. The spatial and visual function is measured by this technique. And basically, the mouse sits, sits in the middle of a chamber which has TV screens on all four sides. And there is a virtual rotating cylinder of light and dark stripes, as you see here. And the natural tendency of the mouse is to visually track this. So there's constant head movement, movement like this, which is detected by a a camera up here in the top. If, however, one starts to decrease the spacing of these, you get to the point where they can no longer detect the light and dark bars, and then they stop tracking it. And that gives you spatial frequency. You can also get contrast detection by decreasing the, the uh, contrast. And I, I believe you have one of these machines here as, as well. So this is a measure of visual function. What's interesting about this is that this, there's a decline in this visual function with age. Um, and with diabetic retinopathy. That was the first study. That's, that's actually been published. Um, and uh, this, is, this, is, uh, age a, this is age after time uh, in diabetic retinopathy. So this is with, um, 
is this is with uh, a a diabetic diet and and STZ uh, as a model of uh, promoting uh, a loss of insulin production, and one gets a decline in visual function. And if you give the SS31 at an early time, it's restored to youthful levels. If you wait uh, 40 weeks later, where the visual function is dropped by half, you still start to see a very appreciable increase. That prompted them to to get in, to get in touch with with us for for doing this with aging mice, and that study is shown here. There's there's th only three three time intervals, and I've connected them with a dotted line to show what we think is happening with visual function uh, as, as as a function of time. Um, the the visual function uh, is up here with the spatial frequency similar similar to what we had in the controls in the, on the left. And that's dropped modestly by, by 25 months. Uh, and it continues to drop over the course of, of this um, four-week treatment. But, but if the mice are, are given the SS peptide by ocular drops, uh, this goes up and reaches youthful levels. If you wait uh, in older mice all the way up at, at uh, 34 weeks, um, then they continue to decline unless they're given the peptide. And then not only do they not decline, but there's a slight increase uh, restoring visual function. That's a separate story. Uh, Hazel and Glenn are trying to pursue this and with, with observations on both the, the retinal pigment epithelium and on the, um, uh, and on the, the, um, the, uh, the uh, rod outer segments uh, and their preservation um, by the SS peptide. I'm going to make the transition here to talk about work in my own lab. Um, it was part of a PO1, but, but I know my own work the best. Uh, and this is in cardiac function. And, the, and in parallel to what Dave Marcinic did with, with very short treatments, uh, we started out with one hour SS treatment and looking at cardiac work performance in old mouse hearts. So these are mice that are, that, that are given dobutamine. And dobutamine uh, increases cardiac work and cardiac output. Um, it is used in humans, too, as a replacement for an exercise tolerance test. If you're not able, for instance, you're, you're, you have a problem with getting on a treadmill and exercising to stimulate cardiac work, um, then the dobutamine is the chemical analog of that. And in mice, we, we give dobutamine. And in the controls, we get about a 35 36% increase in the fractional shortening. If, however, we give the old animals the SS31 peptide first, then that increase in fractional shortening is significantly higher. We're up, up to about 50%. So that was a very short-term effect. Um, we hypothesized that, that that might be the tip of an iceberg in terms of this was, uh, this was a great effect to see, to see short. But I, what I aren't telling you here is that that was the only echocardiographic change that we could see. There, were, there was no change in any other baseline measurement, uh, either in baseline fractional shortening uh, or in the other measurements that I'll, I'll tell you about in a moment um, by echocardiography. But before going there and, and in telling you why we think that there are some changes that are taking place more gradually, uh, come to some structural evidence. So this is what the heart looks like by electron microscopy in the young animal. And one sees mitochondria here, which on high power have very well-ordered Christi with good density and uh, both uh, in, and, and, uh, in alignment. Uh, and you see that the, the mitochondria themselves are aligned between the fibrils. So these are called interfibular mitochondria. Um, and, and some of these here on the side are the subsarcolemal mitochondria. But it's a very well organized. There's, here are the contractile elements um, with, uh, w with their shapes, Z lines, for example, here. Uh, and it's very well ordered, nuclei. Um, however, if one looks at, at the older animals, then one sees both at the higher power, loss of Christi, some degradation of Christi in blank spaces where the Christi no longer are, and some disorganization of the cytoplasm. So now, instead of having this well-organized structure of fibr myofibrils separated by, um, by s small uh, linear uh, streams of mitochondria, we have these, these larger aggregates. So there's just as many mitochondria, but they're disorganized in, in space. With eight weeks of SS peptide, um, these now have a better ultrastructure in terms of Christi organization, uh, and you can see that even the lower power, the higher density here. And the, and the organization of these in terms of the interfibular uh, organization, so both the contractile elements and of the interfibular mitochondria is, is retained. 
we were surprised. We, we had a, a study going on which, which actually is, this is really preliminary data for because we're, it's still underway. But these were so spectacular that I have to show you. These were mice that, are, that were taken off the pumps. The pumps were taken out and we carried them on for eight weeks later. We were interested in what the persistence of the effect might be. So at 28 months for the controls, the, the hearts really do look worse. This is a very progressive and, and this, this ultrastructure um, uh, looks, looks, looks very disorganized. The mitochondria themselves don't look, don't look good. But, with the, but, but now this is eight weeks on SS peptide and eight weeks off. Things really are, are, are looking quite nice. And here's another example just to show you that, that it's not just one mouse. Um, and and a very pretty, almost, I mean, I don't think I could tell the difference between this and youthful. So this is, is really, we're, we're really trying to understand um, what's going on in terms of the biochemistry of the structural reorganization, but, but this is a very dramatic phenotype. To talk about the function, I need to give you a, a little bit of a background in the cardiac cycle as, sure. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to get to a whole bunch of things that didn't work and one of, in, in terms of negative results. And one of those is at eight weeks, there is no elevation of PGC1 or its downstream transactivated targets. Um, and this is kind of one of the mysteries that I'll, I'll get to when I, when, I, when I start to finish, which is that I'm, the previous slide suggests that there's a lot of structural reorganization. There isn't any change, so I'll tell this part of the story now that since you asked, there isn't any change in overall mitochondrial number mitochondrial biogenesis or autophagy at eight weeks. Um, uh, there, I'll show you that there is, a, there is an increased activation of AMP kinase, um, but that's about all that we have, have, have seen in terms of, of as far as we are in these studies. So it, it's, a, it's a little bit subtle. And uh, you know, I wish I could tell you that this is simply increased biogenesis, but recognize that, that at eight weeks, there has been a lot of mitochondrial turnover by normal normal dynamics, the half-life of mitochondrial proteins is, is 10 days in the mouse heart. Um, so by eight weeks, we have gone through a lot of half-lives of mitochondria. So there is a re potential dynamic regenerative process ongoing. And we don't necessarily have to be able to see that by, by an overall increase in mitochondrial content or elevation of biogenesis or autophagy. But it, it's one of the things that makes it harder to explain what is going on, because I think it's a more subtle story. Okay, but in order, in order to, I haven't shown you the functional data, which makes this more interesting than looking at ultrastructure, at least in my mind. So one can, look, one can look at fractional shortening, and I mentioned some of the data that suggests that there is a change in fractional shortening. This is relatively preserved with age in both humans and mice. There is in the early phase of relaxation, and before you can fill the heart, there is an isovolumetric relaxation. In other words, the heart is relaxing, but it's not yet filling. And and that is prolonged, this interval is prolonged with age. Now we get early ventricular filling. And early ventricular filling is mainly by, by relaxation uh, of, and resiliency of, of the left ventricle. Later filling uh, is, normal, is by atrial contraction. So the early filling is passive. Later filling is an active atrial contract, contraction. And the proportion of filling that is early versus late changes with age. In young people, the majority of filling is is early related to passive relaxation, uh, but in later ages, the proportion actually becomes greater for this late ventricular filling. It's more dependent upon atrial contraction for the filling. And this is measured by, by the early to late phase, um, by echocardiography, in the E to A phase. Um, e for early, A for atrial. Um, and this, I'll show you, is, is a reversal that takes place between young and old. Before we actually get to, to ventricular contraction, there was isovolumetric contraction, where you get contraction, but you're not actually yet ejecting uh, blood. And this is also seen. Both this parameter here and this parameter of, of relaxation are reflected in a parameter called myocardial performance index. And that will be one of the ones that I mentioned. And that is prolonged with age. There are also changes in structure with, uh, with left ventricular and left atrial hypertrophy. In humans, there's lots of data because people are well studied, but there's lots of variation, so you have to go to large studies. So here's the, BL, the Baltimore Longitudinal Study and Framingham Studies. Um, an increase in, in wall thickness, uh, lots of variation, but progressive increase with age. And here's this early to late filling ratio, and it declines with age. When it gets to this point of one, this is a, that reversal that I was mentioning, and, and that is a, 
a clinical um, sort of practical definition of, of heart failure with preserved ejection fractions. So these people are now have an impaired cardiac function, but they have a pre preserved ejection fraction. And this is interesting because it is of increasing clinical com importance as one sees a greater frequency of these, probably due to increasing control of hypertensive and coronary heart disease, increasing age of the population in general, one sees an increasing prevalence of, of this heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, or HIF-PIF. Um, here's consecutive admissions. This is the best da data. It's, it's getting a little bit old, but this is the best study that I know of right now at the Mayo uh, consecutive uh, admissions of a percent of patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction goes up with time, and the number of admissions for the diagnosis of HIF-PIF goes up with time. As present, there is no clinical treatment. So this slide is to show you that these changes are also seen in cardiac aging. So here's the increase in LVMI in wild type, and MCAT protects that. Here's this, this decline in E to A ratio, which goes down we get to the level of 24-month-old mice of one, so half of those mice are half HEFPEF, uh, but protected by MCAT. Here's this myocardial performance index, uh, which is this isovolumetric phases. And when that goes up, it's bad, and that's protected. Here's the, the ejection fraction. And there's a modest, you know, this is a scale is from 36 to 40, so this percent is just a 12% decline. The hypertrophy was a 77% increase with age. The diastolic dysfunction was 47%, and the MPI was 90%. So most of the action for cardiac aging in the mouse is actually here on the left, not so much in terms of systolic function. So here's the results that I was trying to lead up to in terms of, of work with the SS peptide. So this is diastolic function, myocardial performance, systolic function, and heart weight that are looked at in old animals, so these are 24-month-old 20 C57 black mice obtained from the NIA colony. And uh, when they come to us, they, they have a, a brief rest from travel. Uh, and then they, they get a baseline echocardiography. Uh, and then they get, a, uh, they get implantation of the osmotic mini pump containing the SS31. So their diastolic function uh, at, at time zero is, as I showed you, uh, about one. Half of them are above and half of them are below this, this critical one parameter in terms of clinical diagnostics. But four weeks and eight weeks later, uh, it is substantially improved, substantially meaning significantly, but also it's about halfway to the youthful level, which I've marked by the, da the dashed line. The myocardial performance index, similar story here, down by eight weeks to about half the youthful level. No change in systolic function, which is as we expected. Heart weights at eight weeks, um, are higher in old animals compared to young animals, and the old animals that are treated with SS31 uh, are significantly reduced in terms of heart weight. So this is the clinical data that actually made us interested in, in, the, uh, in the SS31 as a clinical analog for the MCAT. The MCAT did the same thing, but the SS31 is given to old animals for only uh, four to eight weeks, which is a big difference between lifelong exposure to, a, to an antioxidant and short-term exposure to something that isn't really an antioxidant but is energizing and improving the function of mitochondrial energetics. SS31 and MCAT are actually not additive, however. So, so if, we, if we look at, this is a, a, a separate cohort of animals, um, and these are old animals uh, given saline, no change. Old animals given the SS peptide. Here's this improvement in diastolic function again. Here's the MCAT animals. Over time, they don't change, but they're better than the, than the wild types. And if we give them, give the MCAT animals, the SS peptide, although there might be a trend towards an increase, there's really, they start out pretty good and they stay good. Myocardial performance index, here's that decline. The MCAT animals, a little variable for this assay, um, but they are probably a little bit lower. Um, the SS plus the MCAT are at the same place as the SS peptide ended up alone. So, in this case, they, they, are, they are doing similar things in terms of function, but they're not additive, suggesting that they share, share some mechanisms. But again, I'll point out that one is, one is lifelong and the other is short term. This gets back to Yuji's question, which is what's changing in the hearts? Mitochondrial protein content, the proteome, we're very good at proteomics, and there are really subtle changes in proteomics. And I want you to contrast that with what I'm going to get to in the third half of this presentation. Um, 
that's car talk language, I guess, for those of you who are used to click and clack. Um, it, that is, is, is the rapamycin effects. Rapamycin is positive for all these things that the SS31 is not positive for. Mitochondrial protein content, proteomic changes, mitochondrial biogenesis, autophagy are not up. One parameter that is changed is the phosphorylation status of AMP kinase, um, which, which is a relatively late effect. It's not up at one, two, one, or week, one week or two weeks, but at eight weeks, um, it's significantly different than, than any of the, um, uh, of the three prior conditions. So that's a, that's a story of a work in progress. We've got a lot of work to figure out what is going on there. Uh, and that, that is really, uh, though, the latest update as to where we are now. Uh, I'm going to put that together, and, and, and we'll know a little bit about, uh, about overall this overall um, effect of anti-aging interventions on the heart by telling you the rapamycin story and giving you, an, an, again, an update there. Some of this is published in, in a paper that was published in Aging Cell in 2014 that showed that rapamycin restores diastolic function and myocardial performance in old mice after 10-week treatment. And what I'd like to show you now is the follow-up from that. So this is now work done by a postdoc in the lab, Ann Chow. Ann was actually here at San Antonio working with Mary Lindsay for her PhD. And after being excellently trained by you folks, she came to work in my laboratory where she's been diligently doing much of, of, the, of the work, well, all the work here and, and much of the work that you saw with the SS31 as well. So here is diastolic function as a function of time. Uh, so this, is the, this, is, this recapitulates what was seen in the aging cell paper, but now gives us, gives us the time course. So here are the controls. Um, and with just normal chow, there's no change over time. With rapamycin, uh, at, at 14 parts per million, so the, this is the 1x ITP dose, it goes up progressively with time. As, as you can see here. Same thing with the 3x. This is the, the 49 parts per million in the diet. Uh, and it looks very similar to the, uh, to, the, to the 1x treatment. But you can also see that it's roughly linear increase with time. We stopped at 10 weeks. And I can't tell you what happens longer than that. But, but this was a pretty good effect. Again, we're, we're, out, we're here back up to better than halfway to the youthful level. Myocardial performance index looks like the SS31 in the sense that we start out high and we go low at both the 1x and the 3x, and we're starting to get closer to the youthful level. No change in fractional shortening to speak of, but an improvement in, in, in heart weight to body weight, uh, which is actually uh, significant at one week, two week, and 10 weeks. So the proteomics on this was published by, uh, in Aging Cell, but I've, I've shown just the kernel of that to remind you what that was in a, in a, in a simpler form, concentrating on, on those uh, parts of the mitochondrial proteome that are really important for, uh, those part of the proteome that are really important for mitochondrial function. So this is by ingenuity pathway analysis. These are the proteins that were, that were significantly affected by our treatments in mitochondrial dysfunction, glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, fatty acid oxidation, and the TCA cycle. These are young to old controls, and the majority of these are red because they're higher in the young animals. Um, and uh, whereas the majority of glycolysis and neogenesis in the other direction, uh, you, there's a shift towards these being, these being more important in the, in the old animals. TCA cycle and fatty acid oxidation are, are, go together with mitochondrial dysfunction. So basically, this is suggesting that oxfos is going down with age by glycolysis uh, is going up. This is what is seen in heart failure models as well. And we'll come back to that in a second in terms of the metabolomics and confirmation of this, um, uh, this result. But the old caloric restriction versus old control mimicked the young in all of these parameters, as did the rapamycin. So you can see that, that, the, that the old treated looked like young for in, in most of these. Uh, and that was the substance of, of this report. Uh, this was also in that initial report, suggesting that, that there was indeed a change in, in terms of, of, a, of of increased reliance on the TCA cycle and a decreased reliance on glycolysis. Um, so that was suggested by, by the metabolomics, but it didn't give us the time course. So more recently, Anne Chow, together with our metabolomicist, Dan Raftery, um, have been looking at the kinetics of this. So a variety of, of glycolysis enzymes we now see are changed relatively quickly. So this is, these, this is at the control level. So this is relative to the average. This is just on a, on a, on a scale of what is the average. It starts out high and, and quickly goes, becomes lower. So it reaches, reaches the largest change at, at one and two weeks. Uh, branch chain amino acid 
uh, are up transiently. So this is valine, leucine, and isoleucine, three of the four branch chain amino acids um, are, are, are up. And that's a quick effect at one week. Uh, anaplorosis is the utilization of the amino acids for, for as, a, a, as an energy source. Uh, and this, this goes up at two weeks. And this probably stays a little bit higher at, at 10 weeks, um, whereas aspartate anaplorosis is, is up by, um, uh, by one and two weeks and maybe down a little bit by 10 weeks. So the point here being that some of these changes now we see are relatively rapid. Continuing on that theme, this is, the, this is really the gold standard for looking at energetics and substrate utilization. And that is to take old isolated perfused hearts, you put them in a Langendorf preparation where it's ex vivo, but the heart is intact, still beating, and being perfused by um, nutrient solutions. And now one can measure cardiac work in terms of the rate and pressure that's produced. One can give a carbon-13 glucose in the medium and look at where it ends up by NMR. And one, while it's in the NMR, can look at the phosphocreatine to ATP ratio, the PCR to ATP. So we've done all of those. This is the young. This is the old. And there is a decline in work that can be performed in the old hearts. And this goes, this goes up at, at, with rapamycin at one week, two week, and 10 week. The data was a little bit noisy, so the significance was only here at 10 weeks. Uh, but it looks as though the trend was relatively rapid. Here is the proportion of, of C13 that goes into fatty acid synthesis versus glucose. And that drops with age. This is, this, this is it dropped from here to here. is actually relatively substantial. Uh, it's a, it's a, about a, a 30% drop and a proportionate uh, increase in, in other sources uh, of, uh, of glucose utilization. That's reversed in one week in, with rapamycin treatment. And we're now back to the youthful levels of fatty acid oxidation as the substrate utilization for, for, um, uh, for energetics uh, in the mitochondria uh, and, and sustained uh, in, at the later times. The PCR to ATP ratio is is down significantly, a relatively modest, modest effect in, in this assay, uh, but significantly increased to the youthful levels by two weeks and 10 weeks. So the point of this is that, that many of the changes that we've been looking at here in terms of rapamycin effects are relatively acute in terms of, of the uh, energetics. They are also acute in terms of, of signaling changes. So here's phospho S6 as target of, of uh, TORC1. Uh, down at one weeks and two weeks, actually starts to come up at 10 weeks. Um, Phospho-PKC-alpha, so this is actually now looking at TORC2 uh, signaling. And, and we all understand now in the aging field that rapamycin also affects TORC2 uh, and down rapidly. And uh, Phospho-AKT, also down at both serine and tyrosine uh, at relatively early times. Uh, and 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 returning. So again, the signaling is relatively rapid, and if anything, starts by 10 weeks to return closer to the baseline level. So there's there is a um, there's a, a, a transient increase. So concordant with this and the metabolomics and, and everything else I've been been telling you in terms of the time course is that uh, rapamycin promotes autophagy at one week. We were surprised in the initial report. If you look, look back at that paper, it says that autophagy was not elevated at 10 weeks. And in, indeed, that's what we saw. But there is an elevation in the, in the LC3 to 1 ratio that is significant at one week. And in, in the abundance of ATG5 is up at one week and down at 10 weeks. The really, the, the, again, here going to the gold standard, the gold standard for, for assays of autophagic flux is to inhibit the turnover of mature autophagosomes. Uh, if those go into lysosomes, they would be degraded if the lysosomes uh, are, are active. One can add lupeptin, for example, and, uh, and inhibit that. And then one sees an accumulation of, uh, of LC3, mature LC3-2. Um, and that, that accumulation is a, is a measure of flux because you've inhibited its processing. So what one sees is that in the absence of lupeptin, there's no difference between, between um, the, the, the presence or absence of, uh, of, uh, uh, of rapamycin. It's hard to see. There's a tiny increase, maybe, but it's not significant. Uh, if one adds lupeptin in the absence of, 
of rapamycin, not much of a difference, but the combination of rapamycin and lupeptin gives a significant increase. So this is the, the increase in autophagic flux. This is all at one week. If you do the same thing at two weeks, you don't see a, the rise of autophagic flux. So this, this better assay shows that autophagy is induced or, or really proves better what is suggested here, that autophagy is up very early at one week, reaching its peak and declining thereafter. Um, so mitochondrial biogenesis is another parameter that was not up at 10 weeks. Um, but here is, in fact, now we know what happens is that, that activation of PGC1 is transient. It's up at one weeks and two weeks, and it's down at 10 weeks. Um, TFAM uh, target, um, mitochondrial transcription factor A, uh, is up at one week and two weeks and down at 10 weeks. Uh, and again, here is this uh, phospho AMPK activation of AMP kinase uh, is up very quickly. It's sustained in this particular case. So. Uh, so the story here is really one of autophagy and biogenesis being activated in, in one or two weeks, and that is consistent with proteomic changes in metabolic remodeling. The changes in, in proteomic pathway are fairly pronounced between one week and two weeks, and that's just shown here contrasting one week rapamycin versus control and two week rapamycin versus control. There are many, many of, of, the, of the proteins are discordant in terms of their color changes being, being different here. So those are relatively early effects. This leads rise to an overall model in which we think that, the, that both SS31 and the rapamycin are, are improving mitochondria by remodeling energetics, metabolism, and the proteome. You can intervene in the proteome and get an improvement in energetics and metabolism, or you can intervene in energetics and get an improvement in metabolism in the proteome. And this remodeling takes place in relatively early we believe. This must give rise to signals, which presumably are ATP, ROS signaling, and, and redox signaling more generally, and that give rise to cardiac remodeling. And the cardiac remodeling is presumably what we're seeing by echocardiography uh, in both uh, SS31 and, and rapamycin. And this, this involves factors which the heart failure people have studied for years, but are not so much studied in aging. But presumably, we, we can extrapolate from the heart failure people that this involves changes in the actin my, myosin cytoskeleton, uh, that, for instance, in, in their relaxation properties, changes in calcium reuptake, including circa 1, uh, and changes in extracellular matrix, including fibrosis. And presumably, changes in these are what is responsible for the cardiac remodeling at 4 to 10 weeks that gives rise to our echocardiographic changes. And Ultimately, these changes are giving rise to a decrease in HEFPEF, an increase in endurance, for instance, treadmill endurance, and presumably a decline in frailty and aging phenotypes if we translate this to people. So the questions that arise are, what are these mechanisms? Do these mechanisms of SS31 and rapamycin overlap, and what are their differences? Which of these kinds of signals are important? Presumably, we hypothesize that they are modulating post translational modifications, whether they are phosphorylation from ATP or redox-sensitive modifications, um, such as thiolation um, and, or, uh, or, um, uh, or other, other changes in, in redox environment, including NAD and ADPH ratios, uh, are, are modulating the cardiac uh, remodeling. What are the mechanisms of cardiac remodeling? I've mentioned the possibility that it's actin myosin. One can look at cross bridging, calcium reuptake. One can look at circuit two, extracellular matrix cross linking, and fibrosis. We're just starting that story, but but I will give you some some preliminary insight that indeed we're on the right track. Here is rapamycin looking at passive stiffness with our colleague Mike Rainier, who actually is is a a bio, biophysical cardiologist, uh, and this is looking at at cardiac trabecula, small pieces of cardiac muscle from old mice, and, we, and now you take them out and look at their passive stiffness. You, you use a force, a force meter and, and increase the length and ask what is the passive tension increase. If you do that in young animals, um, you get this passive increase, which is low. If you do this in, in old controls, these are 24-month-old animals, you get a much greater stiffness, so the, their tension increase is large. If you have treated the mice for, in this case eight, case, eight weeks of rapamycin, you get something that's intermediate. It's not quite halfway, although it, at some time points it's getting close to, to halfway, but we're, we think we're on the right track in terms of looking at these mechanisms uh, for improved cardiac relaxation and performance. 
So the final conclusions, SS31 improves mitochondrial function in the old mice. Uh, the acute effects argue in favor of mechanisms of redox and energetics as opposed to an antioxidant effect. It reverses at least three aging phenotypes, and I've shown you vision, skeletal muscle, and, and heart function. There are other phase two studies in progress to look at other phenotypes in, in disease as opposed to aging, uh, but these are, these are very relevant to aging, and we think that strategies to enhance mitochondrial function in aging may have very substantial benefits that are pleiotropic. That is to say, there would be multiple organ systems that could be affected, especially those that are highly energetic, uh, in demand, including, including muscle and, uh, and the nervous system. Rapamycin has rapid effects on mitochondrial function via activated proteostasis. This may be a different mechanism than we see in the SS31. Um, so proteostasis may be one way to have an effect in improving energetics another. But the longer time to achieve functional benefits for both drugs, we think implies that there are additional cellular and tissue remodeling that's required. And these effects can be more complicated. My prediction is that, that in the aging field, as we get interventions that improve overall health span and organ function, finding out exactly how each one of these interventions does that, accomplishes that in a particular organ system, is going to be a different story, maybe with some common threads. But the heart is going to be be different than the brain, which is going to be different than the endothelium. And we really have our work cut out for us. If we think we're, we, we have simple stories now, just wait till we have to figure out why this all works in multiple organ systems. On the other hand, this is a, a good uh, employment security because there's lots of work to be done. So <laughs> acknowledgments uh, and mem lab members, Ann Chow has done much of, of the recent work. Uh, Nate Basisti helped a lot in proteomics and in and the MCAT prote uh, pleiotropy story. Uh, Daofu Dai um, and, and Pavlu Kar Karunadamra, previous uh, postdocs in the lab. Ellen Quarles is still working on, on, um, uh, on the, uh, the rapamycin. Uh, and uh, Autumn Tochi got a, um, a master's with us on the rapamycin project. I've mentioned some of my collaborators, uh, both in our program project. And uh, Rong Chan and Steve Kolwitz helped in the, um, in the ex vivo studies, Dan Raftery uh, in metabolomics and Dick Beyer, and then lots of help from funding institutes and, and special hats off to the AFAR and the Elson Medical Foundation uh, that really helped as well as the NIH. Um, the, only, the only commercial source was that the, uh, that the SS31 uh, was provided by Stealth Biotherapeutics, but uh, I have no other interest in them other than the fact that they were willing to share the, uh, the, the chemical with us. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Peter, for a phenomenal presentation. Let, let me start with our friends in the, in the park. Ah, howdy, folks. OK, let me. Um, <coughs> Can you hear us now? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Uh, any questions out here? <laughs> so I have a big question. So the SS31 doesn't work in the catalase mice. What do you, what's your comment? I mean, that's where still have some uh, antioxidant activity, right? Well, uh, you know, so so our our hypothesis is that that the the absence of additive effects here could be interpreted in the same way as, as one, one does in, in many genetic interventions, which is to say that they're, they're acting in a similar pathway. Now, this is complicated because as I showed you, um, similar here means they're both acting on mitochondrial energetics, but, but one is an antioxidant and one is, is a re-energizer. But the re-energizer also results in a, in a reduction in uh, the, the leakage of electrons from the electron transport chain so that we get, in both cases, an improved redox status. So I think that, that the MCAT animals have an improved redox status. It's lifelong. They have a benefit there. The SS31 animals have, a, have an improvement in energetics and redox status. But the, 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 both of them are getting to the same endpoint functionally, so that when you put the two together, they're not additive. So this is an example of where the pathways are overlapping, but not identical in terms of the actual underlying mechanisms. At least that's my interpretation, with a little bit of hand-waving here. But that's, that's uh, uh, we're going to be studying this. There's, there's another aspect to mention. The, uh, uh, another way to put this together is, is the caveat that I mentioned was the MCAT was lifelong. Well, there are two ways to change that. One is an inducible MCAT, 
which model which we have and we have used in past studies. The trouble with that is that to tell you what the aging result of that is, there will be a two-year delay before we have aged those. So we are actually collaborating with Dongshan Duan, who has made a MCAT AAV and has published that that has a uh, improved treadmill endurance. Uh, he did not look at the cardiac phenotype, but we're doing that right now. And in fact, yesterday or today, the echo data on the AAV um, trans transduced uh, mice uh, should be being read by Ellen Coral. So I hope that when I come back, I've got a happy story. But that will sort of separate the temporal aspects. And now, now we can use use that model to ask whether whether there is a um, if, if they may well be additive in the sense of the MCAT. I'm going to predict, if given transiently for eight weeks to an old animal, is not going to be as effective as the SS31 in accomplishing the same aims. So that would be the next step. And my, my prediction is that those will not look overlapping in that point, because pure elimination of, of accumulated oxidative damage in eight weeks will not be sufficient to return them to as good a state as the SS31 confers. That's pure hypothetical. You'll have to stay tuned for me to know the answer. I have another quick, very quick question. So did you test the SS31 compound on cellular senescence in older mice? Um, so, it, it, so we've been looking at heart. And the senescence markers in heart are very difficult to look at. So the, the one we've spent the most time on, because in many systems it works very well, is P16. Um, and uh, we've collaborated with Yusin Su's lab. Uh, and because they've had a lot of practice in looking very carefully. And there is just not a lot of P16 activation in the heart. Um, so, uh, and P53 increases, uh, we've also not seen. So I, you know, the, I think the senescence biomarkers in the heart are very hard to see. Um, there is not a lot of, um, uh, there's not a lot of, of, uh, uh, of cell death or uh, apoptosis in the heart either. So I think that the, the answer there is that it's, it's just hard to see what you might think of as conventional markers. We've not yet looked at, uh, at beta, uh, senescence-associated beta-galactosidase. Um, and uh, some others have, have shown slight increases in that on the heart. I guess we have to move on to try that to answer your question. Peter, I have a, a question and a comment for you. Uh, so regarding the SS31, can you uh, just remind me of the literature regarding invertebrates, whether it actually in increases lifespan? Is it taken up? Has it been administered? Um, and what are the effects? Yeah, I'm, I, you know, I, I thought, I, I have tried for quite some time to interest my collaborators. Uh, and there's three people uh, at the University of Washington who, who should and could do those experiments. Uh, and it, it was just always on their back burner. The, the challenge is we don't know, it doesn't get through the cuticle, most likely. Um, very little does. Uh, and one doesn't know how much the, the uh, worms, for example, are ingesting um, or flies. Uh, however, very recently, there, was, there, there is reported a paper. If you look for traumatic brain injury and in flies, um, you will find, uh, oh no, it, it's not brain injury. I think in this case, it was, it was, it was a body injury. Um, and they, did an, they actually gave the SS31 by microinjection into flies. So it's a little bit different answer, but it was a protective effect. So in an injury model, the SS31 was protective in flies, and that's the only invertebrate data that I know of. OK, interesting. And then the comment that I had was, uh, during your talk, I was, I was trying to find a paper for you that I came across, I don't know, within the last couple of months. Uh, maybe you saw it. It was, it was a paper that had said that, uh, that there seemed to be a connection between Christie across mitochondria, and so they seem to be all uh, lining up as if, as if there was some kind of uh, like structure coming out of mitochondria and then changing or at least aligning the Christie in neighbouring mitochondria. Did you come across that work? Uh, I and did. the reason why I bring it up is because that eight-week eight week old data in, in your um, uh, uh, cardiac tissue uh, I wondered whether it was just, if you recover the Christie, then you recover the morphology in the, in the muscle itself. It's so, a long-range effect. So, so this is a paper out of Doug Wallace's lab that, that, uh, that quantitative, we're talking about the same thing as a relatively recent paper. What they said was, and, and they were the first ones to quantitate this, although if you look at it, it's kind of obvious, that the Christie are oriented so that they meet, they meet at end-to-end uh, -end in adjacent mitochondria. And you can see that lining up here and lining up here, and even these. So these are, are a little bit disorganized in the sense of they're doing little U-shapes here. 
Um, and we've lost some Christie to be able to make good connections, but they're trying to do that uh, here as well. Um, so we're, we're in the process of quantitating these EMs, and that is actually one of the, uh, uh, one of the changes that, that one would try to quantitate. Here's an example where they're not lining up well. Um, these just, they just, they aren't, they aren't preserved enough to line up, whereas they, they are lined up here. So Shane, is that the paper that you, you were thinking of? Yeah, you know, I think it is actually. I think now that you mention it, it, must, it was Douglas. Yeah. But it, that, that would actually provide a simple explanation here for a self-organizing principle, right? Well, uh, it's always fascinated me why, why we have those nice, nice structures there in muscle. So, so the, these structures here are presumably essential for having the, the energetic source next, next to the energetic consumption. And so having these interfibular organizations is, is what people have always hypothesized is, is responsible for, for having this interfibular organization. This, this organization here puts an increasing emphasis on the, the, uh, the Christi uh, membrane, outer membrane junction. So there, there is now an increasing awareness that, that there is a lot potentially going on at this junction, potentially also involving OPA1. Um, yeah. So I think there's increasing attention to that, and that's one of the things that, that, that we, would be, we are looking at with the SS31. Yeah. It looked uh, you can find the mitochondria is swollen. Oh, uh, yeah, that, so so mitochondrial dimensions prob they probably are they probably are swollen. Although here's an example where you can't tell that by looking. Um, you know, it's not. I, I've seen examples of mitochondrial swelling and following ischemia reperfusion injury that are a lot more prominent. Um, the quantization of this is being being done. Uh, this is the kind of thing we give to to helpful undergraduates, um, and. Um, and the undergraduate had to go to, on Christmas break, so I don't have the data for you. But, um, uh, but I think that it's going to require quantitation to, to get an answer to that. Because while you can see some examples like this one's bigger than this one is bigger than this one, um, that's not, um, not, not necessarily the case uh, on average. I'll have to wait to tell you that. Yeah. OK, well, well thanks. Yeah. So you yeah. So, right. This the 28-month-old mice here, because we can only give the SS peptide for for the the, the IACUC will only let us put in two mini pumps, one in each side, and then we run out of sides. Um, so that's eight eight to to, um, to twelve eight to ten eight to twelve weeks, depending on what kind of pump we use. And, and with the old mice, we have trouble with the larger pumps. So essentially, this turns into eight weeks. These mice had pumps for eight weeks, and then the pumps taken out, at which point they were then eight weeks older, uh, with really crummy looking structure, ultra structure, and better looking ultra structure. So quite a contrast. Um, so so, that, so what, what you've asked is aim three of our program project. If you get a chance to review it, then you would like it. The previous reviewer said that's not very mechanistic. That's just descriptive or maybe translational, but they really called it descriptive. But this is one of the problems. We, one would really like to know. We call this a reversal phenotype, and what you're asking about is an attenuation phenotype, and just to reduce it to simple language. And we've proposed to do an attenuation by giving it not, not starting at youth, at young age, but at 18 months. So this would be, I mean, nobody's going to take anything lifelong when they're feeling healthy. But, but if we can give it uh, at at 18 months in some, some form of intermittent or not, like either rapamycin or SS peptide, and then, then we start to get into, into what the optimal translational therapy is to prevent the onset of these things. While at the same time, for those people who are already old and, and disabled, being able to reverse it is a bonus. We have, we have focused on, on translational 
assays, and uh, just because that's that's where we hypothesize the, the initial effects are. So my answer to this would be that, that what we're seeing in terms of effects on proteostasis, both at the level of translation, and we've looked by polysome profiling, uh, as well as proteomic abundance, which changes, and autophagy, which is elevated, all of these are, are protein homeostasis. At the same time, though, that and, and this is what we see early, but to answer your question, by the time one is seeing this kind of remodeling of structure and an improvement of contractile function and, re and, and relaxation function, at that point, I think that the programming is, 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 very, is going to be multiplex, where one, and that's certainly going to include transcriptional changes. But for the rapamycin in particular, I think the, it's reasonable to hypothesize that the initial effects are by proteostasis. And that the, but the slower changes that, that, that require more complex remodeling are going to involve a lot of post-translational modifications and translational changes. So um, uh, there, I, there it's go that's why it's going to be complicated, is that, that now when one's looking at an overall system response to, to some specific stimuli that are, have, have very, very important but complicated downstream manifestations. One of the mechanisms that links proteo, uh, proteostasis uh, to redox chemistry is actually protein glutathione. And have you been looking for the SS31 is able to control the protein thiol redox state as quickly as it um, well, or as, so, as effectively as the uh, metcat? Yeah, so, um, so in fact, it's it's certainly quicker because we can't can't do the MCAT so quickly until we get the AAV, and and even that it takes a little while for for expression. The the SS31 changes probably are very rapid. The, this this was this actually I didn't go over this. This thiol affinity enrichment actually is looking at protein glutathione elation. So these these changes and th this particular protocol that Wei Jun Khan has has developed can be modified to look to look at at various kinds of thiolation depending on upon what kind of, of chemical treatment is given prior to the to the um, to the to the enrichment um, or the the on actually it's at the on resin triptych digestion stage um, but these these are rapid these are changes in protein glutathionylation at four weeks um, so. Um, Redox status, so it, which includes glutathionalization, but, but now, now this is more complicated um, because, because redox status uh, involves things, things like, um, like uh, uh, NAD and ATPH, uh, glutathione redox status, or looking at various enzymatic redox pairs. And we get different answers when we look at different, different of those, and they're not, they're, they're, they are not in concert with each other. The, actually, this, this NADPH, NADP, in mitochondria specifically, is, is the largest change that we see. Um, changes in, in, uh, in glutathione uh, oxidized to redox to reduce state is relatively modest in this system. Uh, and um, there are some changes in, in uh, GPX2 and 3 um, uh, redox status by looking at, I think that assay is done by looking at at monomers versus motomers, uh, and those do change, um, but they're, they're not as large a magnitude of change. And I don't know the answer as to the speed of change, although I'm expecting that those, that those are rapid. Uh, again, a lot of this work on, on the redox um, the, the redox signaling is, is part of what we need to do to understand this better. But it would explain why there's no additive effect. Oh, absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I certainly in terms of redox status, I, I meant to say that the that the MCAT and the SS peptide may end up in, in the same place of a beneficial redox status. And if you put two redox statuses together that are both good, you end up with just good and not better. Yeah. Okay. So at the beginning we talked, you showed that uh, based, you said that based on the proteomics data, right, the young MCAT might well, that's that's according to the proteomic signature. Now, I, so we have never looked at the young mice in terms of of other performance measures, the kinds of things that we would do. <coughs> excuse me, as as health span assays. Um, it wasn't a control that we thought of looking at. Um, on the other hand, there is no obvious there is no obvious deficit 
uh, in terms of, of their appearance or function. So it's, it's not that they display any, any visible change in their phenotype. Having said that, if we stress them um, and put them through various assays, um, then, which one might do now, I, it's quite possible that there will be some deficits in some of those um, that, um, that are going to show that it's, that it's a, a, a negative phenotype. Um, but in the disease models that, that were looked at, those were really, I think, in the realm of pathological ROS. And that's why, even if they weren't old, they were in diabetes or Alzheimer's or other, other models in which one could say that we're in the realm not of physiologic signaling, but of pathological ROS. So with a hand-waving response, that's why all the data to date has made it look good, and people haven't looked at the more subtle effects that might be present. And we're just hypothesizing those effects based on a proteomic signature. Um, so, but it, it's something that definitely bears to look at. And it goes together with what people think of as the, as the good and the bad, the give and take of redox and antioxidants. Which, and I think, but if one keeps that in mind, then the apparent conflict in the literature and, and in people's mind about whether the free radical theory is right or wrong or Ross is good or bad starts to be much clearer in the sense you have to understand the context. And part of the context is the age. Hey, so what about wrap-up and all the stuff work? And have you uh, combined the 31 um, So uh, the structural changes in, in the heart with rapamycin, uh, which we did a quick survey of quite some time ago, were not very dramatic. I think we have to go back and look at that because that, that now becomes a potential point of contrast between the, the two systems. But our initial impression uh, was that that, that that was not a dramatic reversal, nothing like what I've shown you here today. So uh, we need to return to make sure that that's the case because right now that, that sort of a, sticks out as a, as a thumb of, uh, of quite a difference between them. Um, the, the combination of, the, of SS31 and rapamycin is a really interesting translational question. There, there's not a chance in the world that a funding agency is going to, is going to fund us to do that, but, I, but that was given to the, to the, to the master's student. Um, and uh, it needs to, the answer is that it, it needs to be redone because she was not good enough with the echocardiography <laughs> to get us a, a meaningful endpoint. So that, we, we made a try at that one, and we'll have to put more, more effort into it, but um, I must say that, that because, because that, doesn't, that answers a really interesting translational question, but not so much. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty long downstream uh, mechanistic question. Our, the funders at the NIH were not, the reviewers would not be as happy with that. One more. Uh, what about 401 and 14 knockouts? Well, so you have to be really careful of, uh, of that, and that was, a, that was a, a message that I agreed with Veronica on. Um, the knockouts have terrible phenotypes. Um, you have to, for, for regulation of mTOR, you have to be very subtle. You have to use a, a very even hand. If you do, if you do a, a, a torque one knockout or a raptor knockout um, or, uh, or, or go upstream of that or, or downstream, we've gone to a, a 4 ebp one um, constitutively uh, non-phosphorylated, uh, everything is bad. Uh, however, if you look at low levels of of modulation genetically uh, of uh, mTORC1, and we've done that by, um, by, a, uh, uh, by looking at, at a hemizygous raptor. Ronk has done it with a, a, conditional, um, uh, a conditional knockout um, with various levels of, of induction. Uh, then you can titrate that to, to a beneficial level. And beneficial in rough terms is, is somewhere around 50% reduction. Where's the current? Uh, current restriction, yeah. So the Oh, caloric restriction. Where does caloric restriction? Uh, I'm sorry, it was, it was my, my confusion. I, was, I, I, thought it, I thought that was current restriction, and I don't know where any current restrictions are. Well, caloric restriction, uh, I, I mean, fits closest, especially in the heart, to, uh, to rapamycin. So when we compared those two directly, they were very similar at, at the proteomic uh, signature level, they were very concordant. That's in the, the Aging Cell 2014 paper. Um, 
the phenotypes in terms of, of uh, cardiac performance are very similar. Um, in contrast, in the liver, in a paper that came out a year later, uh, in 2015, in the liver, uh, the proteomic signatures, especially in the mitochondria, are quite divergent. Um, so um, the answer is, is that for caloric restriction in rapamycin, it's, it is organ dependent uh, and maybe age dependent upon whether they act the same or different. And this, this is to say that they, that they, they, share, they share mechanisms uh, in terms of both affecting TORC1 uh, and indirectly uh, other signaling pathways. Uh, nutrient depletion by caloric restriction is probably doing a whole lot more. In, in some cases, the phenotypes overlap. And in other cases, the phenotypes at the biochemical level are different. In both cases, though, one is certainly going to get a change in proteostasis, and that will be uncommon. How about with SS31? So SS31 is, is not looking like a change in proteostasis. As I mentioned, there, there is, there, we're not seeing a change in autophagy, and the, the changes that are taking place in, um, in proteomics are very subtle. We've done pretty okay. well. I think Great. we're done. Thank you very much. Thank Peter. you all.